Good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome Chris Kimball to Google. Uh, I'm sure he needs no introduction, so I'm going to do a very brief one. He's the founder of Cook's Illustrated Magazine. It was founded back in 1980. And he's the host of America's Test Kitchen, which is the most watched cooking show on public TV. And he's made so many contributions to the culinary industry that um, I'm not even going to try to mention them, but uh, he did found Who's Who in Cooking in America. And at least in my kitchen, uh, America Test Kitchen cookbooks are, are a must have. And Chris is here today to talk about the science of good cooking. If you haven't picked up your copy in the back, please do. It feels like the Johnny Carson show or something, you know. <laughs> so there's a little bit about, I won't talk too much about the book, but about what we do at the test kitchen. You know, the, the fundamental precept of science is you sit around and think about why things happen, and then you devise an experiment to either prove or disprove that. So you watch the apple fall, whatever. And the ultimate example of this, I got on, there's a YouTube video about this actually. It's about 40 minutes long. It's great. A guy called Lawrence Krauss, cosmologist. And he decided, with a bunch of other cosmologists a few years ago, to figure out whether we live in a closed, open, or flat universe. Th this will have something to do with cooking eventually. So in a closed universe, it collapses. We have a big bang. We all die. In an open universe, it expands ex exponentially. In a, in a flat universe, it expands, but the rate of expansion slows. So they were trying to figure out how to do that relatively simply. And so the first thing they said, well, OK, in a flat universe, light travels in a straight line. In a closed or open universe, light diverges or converges, which means that if you looked at something a long way from Earth, it would be bigger or smaller than it actually is. If you live in a flat universe, it'll be the right size. Okay, so the next thing was what to measure. Well, they said, let's go as far away from you know, Earth as we can, because uh, the farther away we are, the more we can see that converging or diverging of the light. So let's go back to the Big Bang, 13.72 billion years ago. Problem with that is, for about 100,000 years after the Big Bang, it was like looking at the center of the sun. It was pea soup, couldn't see anything. So about 100,000 years later, you could start to see things. And so, okay, that's, that's a good distance. Now the question was, what, what are you gonna measure? And here's where it got, it got a little weird. They said, well, the universe is only 100,000 years old. Nothing travels faster than the speed of light. So that includes gravity. Gravity can't travel faster than the speed of light. So, the biggest thing could be 100,000 light years. Because if you're a lump of matter, you want to attract other matter, you couldn't communicate farther than that. It's like a little town in Germany 2,000 years ago, you know, a village that maybe people from 20 or 30 miles might come in. But if you were 500 miles away, you didn't even know the village existed. Same thing. So they said, OK, so the object would be there. We know where it's going to be, how far away. And it should be 100,000 light years. That's the maximum size, which turns out to be one degree of 360 in the sky. So the other question is, how do you measure it? And they said, well, we'll send up a balloon. They're like, this is what I like. These guys sit around trying to figure out what kind of universe. They get this big helium balloon. They send it up. And it has essentially a camera that measures mi the background mic microwave radiation from that point. Light waves as they travel, flatten out. Infrared microwaves have the longest wavelength. So for those of you, and there aren't many of you here, there's a few of my vintage in the days television stations stopped broadcasting, oddly enough, at one or two in the morning, you get static on your television set. And 1% of that static was, in fact, microwave radiation from just after the Big Bang. So you, you could actually see it. So th they took pictures, and, the, and they developed it. And, they, and they, they put it up on the wall. And it turns out that the, the biggest things they saw were exactly one degree. And that was exactly what was predicted. And so since it was one degree, we live in a flat universe. So, that's exactly what we do at America's Test Kitchen. <laughs> See? Uh, on a slightly smaller scale. So we don't have big balloons. So we, uh, but we use scientific principles. Uh, equilibrium. This was invented or discovered about 1750 in, in France. Uh, French scientists decided, well, OK, um, I don't have balloons, but I have pig's bl pig bladders. I'll fill it with alcohol and put a big tub of water, and I'll see what happens. Well, of course, what happened was water is 100% water, alcohol is 50% water, so some of the water from outside went through the membrane to create equilibrium. Uh, that's called osmosis. Um, diffusion, uh, and, and if, if you're going to brine a turkey next week, there's a little osmosis there. 
Uh, salt, you put salt on the outside of a turkey or in a brine, and that's diffusion. The salt from the outside goes on the inside to create equilibrium. So when you brine, you're using a very old uh, scientific concept of equilibrium. And what happens is the chicken or the turkey soaks up water, and if there was no salt in the, in the there was no brine, there was no salt, that water would come out during cooking. But what the salt does is it uh, takes the proteins, it denatures them, they, they are able to now hold on to water because there's now room for water to get into the proteins. Some of the proteins turn into a gelatin, which also absorb water. So what the salt does is help the turkey hold on to water even when heated and roasted. So not all of it leaves, some of it actually stays, and that's all based on an old premise. Um, some of the things we like to do is disprove stupid cooking theories. Uh, you know, the, the world is flat theories. Uh, one of them is sear meat to, to, to seal in the juices. You still, in cookbooks today, and on some cooking shows, will see people say that. And it's just total nonsense. Searing meat sears meat. Uh, it, you know, it's the Maillard reaction, which we'll get to in a second. Amino acids and sugars are creating flavor compounds. But it turns out that juicy meat is just a function of internal temperature. About 110 degrees, uh, meat fibers, they sort of look like insulated wires, will start to shrink around the diameter and the length. The liquid in those fibers get pushed out. The more you cook meat, the drier it gets, and it has nothing to do whether it's seared or not. Um, if you pot roast or barbecue and you start with a piece of meat that has a lot of collagen in it, like pork butt, for example, well, that collagen turns into gelatin, melts, and that will hold on to a liquid. So that does work over a long period of time. Um, another thing people say uh, very often is uh, braising turns out moist, succulent meat. And it you know, kind of makes sense because you have a closed pot and you have a little bit of liquid and you have a pot roast or a piece of pork. Um, in fact, Madeline Kamen in The Making of a Cook, which is a great book you should read, says that very thing. She says the steam gets into the meat, it does this. No, uh, it's, the, it's the same thing. You can boil a pot roast or simmer a pot roast in water. You can roast it in a dry oven. You can braise it in a closed container. And if you get it to the same internal temperature, 185, 190, it'll be exactly the same inside. So it doesn't matter if there's liquid around it, air around it, a little bit of liquid on it, steam, it doesn't matter. It's all about the internal temperature. Um, lots of other things. Uh, recipes say uh, pat meat dry before you, you saute it. Um, and, and by the way, I know, I know what you all do. Even though you work for Google, I know what you do. And that is that you, you take our recipes, and I do the same thing, and you take them uh, as uh, vague directions about what you might do if you actually had the ingredients. <laughs> so, so, and you don't, uh, and, and you don't have the right cookware and lots of other things. So our job is not to create a recipe that works in our kitchen. It's for us to figure out what you do. And uh, what you do is really interesting. As a matter of fact, I think behavioral psychology should spend more time looking at, they do it like how people vote, you know, that now they should do how people cook. Uh, about two years ago, we had a, a chicken breast recipe and we send our recipes out. It takes us five or six weeks to develop a recipe. We send it out to a bunch of you who volunteered. And over the course of a week, two or 300 of you will have made the recipe and you'll fill out a form. And unless 80% of you say you would make it again, we go back in the kitchen. Well, this particular gentleman, uh, and this, this recipe got a great rating. 90% of the people would make it again. This one gentleman said it was the worst chicken breast recipe he'd ever made, which caught our attention. And at the bottom, there's a little place on SurveyMonkey, which is the software we use. Uh, he had a comment, and uh, this, this is verbatim what he said. He said, well, comma, I didn't have any chicken. <laughs> Okay, I substituted shrimp. So if you cook shrimp for 25 minutes, indeed, it would be the worst shrimp recipe you've ever had. But it's my fault, see, so, so it was my job to say in the head note, do not substitute shrimp for chicken in this chicken breast recipe. Uh, so anyway, so, so to go back to the, the steak story, so the problem is if you put a wet piece of meat or poultry in a pan, assuming the pan's the right temperature, uh, the meat's not going to get above the boiling point of water because the water has to evaporate first. So your steak's sitting there at 210 or 12 degrees until that water goes away. So you're steaming the meat. It sticks to the pan. The Maillard reaction, 
which as I said is amino acids and sugars creating flavor compounds, doesn't happen to over 300 degrees, so you're not going to get any browning. And, uh, and by that is a reason, by the way, you shouldn't use nonstick cookware, because 70% of, of cookware sold in the United States is nonstick. It's good for eggs, it's good for seafood, a few other things. Uh, stir fry with a sticky sauce. It's terrible for everything else because you can't create a fond on the bottom of the pan. That brown stuff that when you're first beginning to cook, you throw away because it's messy. And then you realize it has all the flavor. Um, years ago, a friend of mine came over from France. He was a butcher to show us some tricks. And during the morning, he had a bunch of onions, you know, like five or six pounds of onions, a little wine, a little water, a little oil. He, uh, all he did was put it in a big Le Creuset Dutch oven and he sauteed it, you know, browned it, caramelized it. And every half hour or so, he deglazed the bottom of the pot with a little wine. And he didn't add stock. He didn't add any other ingredients. And by 12, 1230, we had French onion soup. And it was the best French onion soup I had in my life. And all the flavor, 100% of it, came from the fond at the bottom of the pan. And so if that had been a nonstick pan, we would have had the world's worst French onion soup. So, so those are just a few of the things. Um, that we've, we've tested. And what, another, another one which is relevant for next week, for those of you who are going to make pie dough, recipes always say add just enough water until the dough holds together. Yeah, whoever, whoever wrote that should be taken out and run over with a truck <laughs> because you're all scared to add too much water. So what happens? You create dry pie dough and it doesn't roll out. It rolls out into pieces and you have to do a pat in the pan crust when nobody's looking, right? That's, that's, that's what's going to happen. I can, because I've done it many times. And the reason you don't want to add too much water is because in flour, there are two proteins, glutenin, which sounds like gluten, but it's different, and gliadin. In the presence of water, they form gluten. And that's why you can have a no-knead bread dough recipe. Because if you let water and flour sit long enough, like overnight, gluten will develop on its own. You don't have to knead bread. So what's going on with pie pastry is a little too much water, that a little bit too much gluten gets developed. So we sat around, just like Lawrence Krauss did years ago, and said, we need more liquid, but we can't use water because water reacts with gluten and gliden to produce gluten. What else could we use? And the obvious answer was vodka. I mean, really. Because <laughs> alcohol actually doesn't react with proteins. Water does. So we said, oh, we use half water, half vodka, add a little bit of extra liquid, another tablespoon, so you have a nice moist dough, rolls out easily. And by the way, alcohol, uh, will dissipate at a much lower temperature than water. So you put it in the oven and you end up with a nice dry flaky dough. So vodka pie crust. And you know, th thank you to our food scientists. Um, one thing I should warn you about food scientists, because I've worked with them all my life. Uh, we have a guy uh, who works with this guy, Crosby, who's very good. Uh, but remember in fifth grade, you had those stupid molecular things with the balls and the, you know. Well, eventually over time, I, I, was, I, I kept asking, I said, you know, do molecules really look like this? And someone said, well, not really. You know, it's just we're trying to, I paraphrase, we're, uh, we're giving you as much information as we think you can handle. Okay? So, great, they think I'm an idiot. So, the, so for all these years, I'm thinking about these red balls and green balls and everything else. And yes, you know, it, it talks about connectivity and other things. But it's, it's, in essence, really, molecules don't look like that. So when you talk to a food scientist, the, when you first time you ask them a question about starchy potatoes, for example, and amylose and amylopectin and everything else, they'll, they'll give you the answer they think you can handle, which is, is basically the idiot's answer. And then, then you come back a couple weeks later and say, well, you know, it doesn't really make sense because they say, okay, okay, I'll, now, now I'll tell you. And then they give you the next layer down. There's like 10 layers, you know, and I'm, I'm working my way down to the 10th layer. I'm about layer seven now because he thinks I can handle layer seven. But the problem with food science is, as Einstein, of course, was not a food scientist, it was too hard, uh, there are too many variables. There's too much stuff going on. So it's very hard to isolate one thing. Even if you isolate, let's say, 10% protein flour from 12% and you do two cakes or two biscuits, it could be that you didn't measure something properly, the ovens were slightly off, uh, it, was a, it was a humid day versus not a humid day. So there's lots of stuff going on, so you have to do things over and over and over again to make sure that your results actually are reproducible, which of course is the essence of science. So um, that's what we do. Uh, and uh, this book is really a result of 20 years of work in the kitchen. We took 50 scientific principles and some recipes to illustrate them. Um, and I, 
I've been on tour, and one of the things I do, uh, if it's a morning show or something, is we have uh, a red bliss potato, uh, a non-starchy potato, and we have a russet potato. The russet potato has more starch, which has got a higher specific gravity and should sink, and the red bliss potato should float. And I did this on the Today Show about a month ago, and they both sank. So, so sometimes the results are not reproducible. So I just, I just hit it behind the other thing and it just went on. So, um, so uh, that's what we do. And um, I'd love to take some questions. And by the way, if, if before someone has the courage to an ask a question, um, Lynn Rosetta Casper from The Splendid Table, whom I've known for a long time, uh, she had this problem once. And she told the audience that she would start removing her clothes uh, if she didn't get a, a question asked, and they, they started asking questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I was wondering two, two things. One of them is that you mentioned um, caramelizing onions. And I know that what Einstein told us cook, that was one of the author's pet peeves. Yeah. And that's a side thing. You can talk. But the question I have is actually about nonstick cookware. That was Wolk, yeah, that guy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The question I have is actually about nonstick cookware. There's actually um, new nonstick cookware coming out. Uh, ceramic, I guess, space mm -hmm. or something else. You, can you talk a little bit about what you think of those? Yeah, we've tested a lot of nonstick cookware. There's low stick cookware like Calphalon, which if you look at it under a microscope, it just has fewer craters in it. It's smoother, so the food doesn't stick as much. Uh, there are ceramic nonstick cookware as well. Um, we basically didn't like any of them. They, they either, either claimed they were greener, which they really weren't, or if they really were green, they weren't nonstick. So we went through all of them, and the one that we ended up with is just the, the classic. They all use essentially the same chemical, slightly different bonding techniques. The problem with nonstick cookware, there's a number of them. First of all, there's something called polymer fume, fume fever. And I actually subjected myself to this just to find out what it was like. So over 500 degrees, uh, you'll see the smoking. Uh, and um, if you happen to have a parakeet in the room, you know the parakeet might not survive that process. Um, I took a big whiff and had a vicious headache for about five hours. Uh, over 600 degrees, that chemical actually starts to break down. And that's why nonstick pans over a year or two, I mean, in our, in our kitchen, they don't last more than a year. Uh, they actually start to break down, and, uh, and that coating actually comes off. So uh, the other thing you can use is cast iron if you are of the mind to season it properly, which takes a little more time, uh, which I like. Uh, but when it comes to doing scrambled eggs, a 10-inch or an 8-inch nonstick all clad or something similar actually is fairly essential. But that's about all I use it for. So I'll say in uh, defense of nonstick, you guys have a great recipe from a few months ago for Thai uh, stir-fried noodles, for which you say specifically, yes. get this nonstick 12-inch pan. Great recipe. I love it. One of the great examples of I don't do it unless I have exactly what Cooks Illustrated says I need to have. Uh, my question... You're uh, the only reader who does. That's I've, good. So you're, I've, I've thank learned, you. I've learned I finally found him. From bitter experience, <laughs> I've learned my lesson. So my question, you guys test all these recipes over and over again in the test kitchen. What do you do with all the food uh, that you well, create? First of all, we're not licensed by the town of Brookline just outside of Boston to uh, serve food to the public. It's a long story. So we, we wanted to give food to the local shelter food bank. We, we, do, we do give canned food, but we couldn't give our cooked food. So we have about 140 employees, uh, slightly smaller than you. Um, and uh, the test cooks in the kitchen, we have about 45 test cooks. It's about a 3,500 square foot kitchen. Uh, the really good food and the really expensive food, like the tenderloin, the lobster, et cetera, um, that immediately disappears. We have these big clear plastic takeout containers and big magic markers. So, you know, I, Chris, you know, for Chris, put the stuff in and go into our takeout fridge. And at night, they bring it home. The food that's pretty good, uh, but not great, uh, we, we call the marketing department down uh, for that. <laughs> so, no, I mean, we, marketing's important, right? Okay. So, uh, and then the really horrible food uh, is the finance people. Uh, <laughs> uh, my, my CFO lives off leftover Halloween candy until January. That's all she eats. Um, and, they, and, they're, and they're grateful for that. So that's, that's how it works. Um, we, we do, we're hoping we can get licensed to actually do something else. We have 140 employees, so it all gets eaten 
And our test cooks never cook during the week at night because they've been cooking all day and they just take the food home. So. Uh, you brought up uh, the concept of brining earlier. And the best Thanksgiving turkey I ever made, I brined. And could you go over some of the basic principles, since a lot of people are going to be roasting turkeys next week, of sure. what it takes to make a good turkey? Uh, yes. We, the, the problem with having a food magazine is every year there's Thanksgiving and we have to come up with a new recipe. So we've done 20, somehow we've come up with 20 versions. Uh, the basic formula is one cup of table salt per gallon of water. If it's going to be, you know, a 12, 14 pound turkey, you'd brine it for somewhere six to eight hours, something like that, or, you know, overnight. You got to keep it cool, preferably no more than 40 degrees, um, uh, which can be a problem if you don't have a cold cellar somewhere or outside. Um, and then you want to make sure it's, it's dried off very well. You put it in a, uh, you can do a 375 to 400 oven, breast side down for an hour, then flip it breast side up uh, and continue cooking it, maybe even increase the temperature for the last half hour or so. Um, we've done lots of other recipes, one of which I like is you cut it into parts and you braise it. I did that last year. It makes, then you get a great gravy out of it and then you don't have the problem with the white meat, dark meat when it's done problem. Um, I just did for morning edition next week, on Wednesday we, run a, we do a segment every year on Thanksgiving and we did a Julia Child recipes, all Julia Child recipes. She's got this great recipe where she takes uh, the backbone out and takes the whole breast and put over a huge mound of stuffing on a, a roasting tray with aluminum foil, cooks that, then she has the uh, thigh and the legs together, those two pieces roasted separately on a rack on a baking sheet. But what she does is really interesting. She takes the bone out of the thigh, which takes about a minute. It's real easy to do. Just use a paring knife. And then she sp spreads it open, puts salt, pepper, a little sage, whatever you want, sewed it up or just wrapped it easily with some string and roasted that. It only took about an hour and a half to cook. And then when you slice the thigh, there's no bone, which is great. And that really works well. And if you like, she also had a picture of, you know, reassembling the bird after it's cooked. So you have that, you know, little Norman Rockwell moment or whatever, um, if anyone does have that moment. So that's, that's the basic concept. The other, other way you can do it is butterfly a turkey after brining. You take the backbone out. It's good to have poultry shears for that. Flatten it, you know, press down the, on the breastbone. And then cook that on a rack over a huge mound of stuffing which is also one of my favorite techniques. So you don't have to worry about a little bit of stuffing in the cavity, which you should never do, because the stuffing takes a long time to get up to 160. You don't have much of it, and the meat will be overcooked. So, so a butterfly, take the backbone out, rack over stuffing, and you get maximum stuffing. So those are three or four suggestions. Did you start as a food writer? Was that what you sort of uh, I started as a primitive art major at Columbia in 1969. Um, well, actually, no, I, d I had four years of the revolution. Um, so we didn't have finals three out of the four years because the secret was we only, uh, we only had revolutions when it was warm, which was in May, usually. So I started that. I worked uh, uh, in a small publishing firm in New York for a couple of years, uh, uh, ran a company for a few years in the 70s that was in and around the whole issue of magazines and publishing. And then I started uh, Cooks in 1980, April 1980. Um, today, if you want to, I've been grandfathered into my own company. I don't think I'd get a job there now, probably. Um, if you want to get a job in our kitchen today, you have to come in and do a bench test, which means that a bunch of people would stand around you with clipboards and not talk while you cook all day. And uh, to see if you have the knife skills, you can expedite. Uh, but really, we're looking for people who are um, incredibly stubborn, um, don't mind doing the same thing constantly, like the same recipe for weeks and weeks on end. You have to develop a recipe on your own and write it up and submit the article. And then um, we do three month inter internships and then usually at the end of that period we'll keep one or two of the people to, to work uh, full time in the kitchen. Um, so what we really do is a group process. We sit down every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. editorial table and whoever's you know, working on a particular recipe talks, we sit down, have ideas. Every time there's a tasting, there's a bunch of people in the kitchen. So it's really very much about a group process. It's not quite one man, one vote, but it's almost that. And uh, that's how we sort of develop the process. It comes from a, um, I went to a high school which used a, a oval table as a, the Harkness table. 
and you'd sit around the table and the professor or teacher would be standing up in the corner and you would have to come up with a position about something about Russian history and you'd have to defend your position as your fellow students ripped you to shreds, which is basically what we do now is to sit around and argue, which I assume you do a lot here too. So. So you're in magazines, but you must also have been kind of crazy about food, and then you also seem to have this kind of scientific bent. Well, I've been cooking since I was about seven, yes. Um, my first recipe was a chocolate cake out of the joy of cooking with a seven-minute boiled icing, uh, which turned out like snot, um, actually. I do still remember the cake. Uh, everyone said it was very good, but I knew it wasn't. Um, uh, and uh, in, the, in the 70s, I started taking a lot of cooking classes, and I realized... Um, there was one guy in particular, who was actually a great guy, but uh, he put on this fake French accent. He was from Florida. You know. But he, he talked talk like Monsieur Mayotte, like this. And uh, he would say things like, you have to scald milk to make a bechamel. Well, I went home, made it with cold milk. It was fine. Uh, he refused to talk about it. And it turns out that you only scald milk if it's raw milk, because pasteurization is scalding milk. And you want to kill off an enzyme that needs to be killed to have it thicken. So, it, it occurred to me, the emperor's you know, new clothes, that a lot of stuff that was being taught at the time in the 60s and 70s was just being passed down. And it, probably at the time it made sense, like when people had nothing but raw milk. But there was a whole bunch of things like that that just made no sense anymore. And uh, the cook war was changing. The food processor came in from Carl Sondheimer in the early 70s. Um, you know, French cooking was going away. American cooking was coming up. Uh, so my interest was actually starting a magazine where you could talk about cooking. At the time, there was cuisine, food and wine, Bon Appetit Gourmet, none of which really focused on the kitchen. It was all about people smiling you know, at parties and traveling and on yachts. And so I just wanted to focus on you know, fudgy brownies, essentially. So you talked about techniques, but I want to ask you about the actual product and ingredients. Uh, I made a conscious decision to switch to grass-fed beef and most of these techniques no longer work because this meat is so different. You know, there's less fat. What recommendations, what suggestions do you have for me? Well, we raise our own beef and pork, too. And we started out doing pure grass-fed. Well, if you, I don't know if you've ever had no grain purely grass-fed, but it's tough and it's strong. And I actually, in the last three months, we grain them, too. So I, I like mostly grass-fed, but I like grain at the end is I think it's better. But it's like trying to cook venison because it's very lean. Um, and the other problem is, um, you know, the butchers love the round, the, the thigh, because this huge hunk of meat with just like a bone, one bone in it. It's not, it's not complicated. So, but the problem is it's lean, uh, and especially grass-fed beef. So I, the first thing I would do is, is get the fattiest cuts. Chuck eye roast, shoulder roast, anything from the chuck. I would never touch the round under any circumstances. Uh, and then, you know, unless you want to lard it, <laughs> like Fanny Farmer used to do, you're probably going to have to cook it low and slow. Uh, but I would get the fattiest cut from a, from a grass-fed beef that I possibly could. Don't get anything lean, because it's going to be lean anyway. I'm curious what your take is on the molecular gastronomy movement, which also sort of builds itself as a science-driven, although probably not as accessible, approach. Uh, well, I'm now an instant expert because I went to see Nathan Mirvo uh, two days ago when he cooked me a 12-course, or his chefs cooked me a 12-course meal uh, one afternoon in Seattle. And um, uh, first of all, okay, let, let me describe. The lab is, he has a lab to do a lot of other things. The modernist cuisine is just a small subset. You walk in, the place is huge. It must have 50 you know, million dollar machines in there to do all sorts of weird things, uh, like 3D printers and stuff. So the first thing I walk in is I see this, <laughs> I see this big uh, HD screen. And things are you know, popping on and off. And I said, what's that? He said, well, uh, a few years ago, we decided to solve the problem of malaria. Okay? Uh, and one of the guys on the team was one of the guys who helped develop the Star Wars project which actually was pretty much a failure, as far as I can tell. And he said, well, I don't know, just get a laser gun and zap them. And then the guy said to me, well, at first we thought that was foolish, comma. I said, what do you mean at first? I mean, it's like, what, it's not foolish now? So he claims, this is like, I didn't believe this. He claims that this thing was actually showing uh, there's a mosquitoes in a glass. Am I losing my voice here? There's a 
Hello? There we are. Uh, he claims he had this big uh, glass container, aquarium of mosquitoes, and they, they could uh, sense the mosquitoes individually. And that's what was showing up on the screen. Then it gets weird. It says they can tell the difference between a male mosquito and a female mosquito. And I said, uh, how do you do that? He said, well, female mosquitoes beat their wings at a different RPM than male mosquitoes. OK. Uh, female mosquitoes bite, males don't. So I said, then what happens? He said, oh, then the laser gun melts their wings and they fall down and die. <laughs> I said, OK, so you're in Africa. Uh, OK, you're in Niger. Uh, and, and you have this $100,000 mosquito killing laser gun. Now what are you going to do? Well, we'd, we'd ring the village with them. I said, <laughs> I said, how about like a dollar for a mosquito net? Like, you know, really? Um, anyway, so I was going like, really? So, so anyway, the, the meal was fabulous, though. I mean, despite, the, the, the and there were no mosquitoes anywhere. Uh, I mean, it, 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 he's proven if you're incredibly smart and you have unlimited capital and time, what you can do to food. It has no bearing on home cooking at all. But, I mean, for example, the pistachio gelato. I love pistachio gelato. I've had it in a lot of different places. And most of the time, it's vanilla ice cream with green food coloring, essentially, because it doesn't taste like pistachio, right? So this pistachio gelato was amazing. It was like amazing pistachio flavor. And he extracted oil. Uh, and guess what? Each scoop, which is about this big, was 25 hours worth of pistachios to get one scoop of pistachio gelato. The other thing he showed me, we, and they were great French fries, but in order to get that crunchy outside, uh, he, he puts the French fries in water. Uh, it's a cavitation. I'm losing my voice again. I think you have to keep putting quarters in the thing. <laughs> um, it's, it's a cavitation device, essentially. It, it says, you know, sonic waves go through the water and rough up the surface of the potato. Uh, and so, yeah, it did work. Uh, but he's extracting maximum flavor. So the answer is, why not? You know, good for him. He's an interesting guy. He's rich. Uh, the, the food was great. Um, but I don't think anybody here is going to be making $25 scoop pistachio ice cream anytime soon. Although maybe some of those techniques end up in a home kitchen in 10 years. I don't know. But it's not what we do. What we do is, you know, most people most of the time, my premise has been, most people most of the time don't have a lot of success in the kitchen. You know, it's not necessarily a failure, but it doesn't turn out exactly the way you want. If you were building uh, airplanes and 80% of the time they fell out of the sky, you know, you wouldn't be in business too long. The recipes, if you think of it as a business, is the only business in the world where you can actually have a very high failure rate and still be around. And so our, our thought was, we're not trying to get you to modernist cuisine or French laundry. We're just trying to get people to the point where most of the time they go in the kitchen, if, if they do follow the recipe, don't substitute shrimp for chicken, um, you know, it'll turn out well. And that's all. That's, we're, we're not trying to, to create chefs. We're just trying to say, you can be confident going in the kitchen and get pretty good results. That's about it. Hi. Uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, my girlfriend and I only get to cook you know, once a week or so. Do you have any advice for rewarding but efficient occasional cooking at small scale? Yeah, the best thing I can say is, um, you know, 100 years ago, uh, the Italian grandmother had a very limited repertoire. Uh, as uh, I was taught to cook by a baker, actually a cook in Vermont. <laughs> Vermont! Um, and, you know, and I have a recipe card. She has about 50 recipe cards. So I, I think the secret has been people had a limited repertoire of foods that were local with techniques that were all related. And that's why they didn't need recipes, because your grandmother, if she cooked, or grandfather, uh, you know, they had a baking powder biscuit recipe, or they had a curry goat recipe, whatever it was. They knew how to do it. So if you're going to start out in cooking and you don't have a lot of time, I, my suggestion is have 25 recipes. Pick 25 recipes that cover, you know, you have a, a braise or a tagine or a stew or a, a quick bread, a soda bread, whatever, and just get a range of recipes that cover most of the bases and get to the point you don't need a recipe. You can make them. Then you can do anything you want. But if, if you do that, it's great. Because the problem with all of you and the problem with me is, you know, on Tuesday night I'm going like, oh, I love that Otto Lenghi recipe from Plenty or Jerusalem. And I want to make that tonight with the gorgonzola and the lentils and the caramelized onions. And the next night I'll say, well, maybe I want something from South America. And then I, you know, well, you never get anywhere because you're changing ingredients and techniques. So stick to 25 recipes. You know, the, the example I like to give is music. Like, 
most aging baby boomers, I have a Grateful Dead cover band, of course. You know, that's typical. <laughs> At some point, you all will have Grateful Dead cover bands or something. <laughs> Aerosmith, I don't know, whatever. So, uh, you know, have you ever seen a 50-year-old pick up a guitar? You know, it, it's a disaster because he or she thinks they can just play it without Guitar Hero. Play it, uh, and they can't because you actually have to know something, like their chords and scales, and their two notes chords, the three note chords, and the triads, and their, you know, there's, there's the, the blue scale and the pentatonic scale, blah blah blah. Jerry Garcia, uh, my hero, uh, he played scales two hours a day, you know. So, so there is something to know, and so by sticking to 24 recipes, you'll actually get the technique down. You, you'll understand something about cooking, and then you can do whatever you want from there. I always work Jerry Garcia in every talk, by the way. So. A uh, question about your turkey recipes. They, they typically deal with kind of smaller birds or medium-sized birds. Do you have ideas on, on cooking larger ones, particularly when you're cooking them upside down to start? Is there a limit to how big a bird you can cook that No, the, the, we, we usually, we like 14 to 16 pound birds because they, I think, usually taste better. But you can get a 22 pounder. The question is, is your oven big enough? And then, of course, you have you know, a bird it's very hot and you have to flip it over after an hour. If, if you do the butterfly technique, however, you don't have to flip it. And if you braise it uh, in parts, you don't have to flip it. But if you do the hour down and then up, um, you do. Um, I just used uh, kitchen towels to do it. Some of those orca silicone mitts and stuff, have you ever tried to use those? Your hands get sweaty uh, and then you, you drop it anyway. Uh, so <laughs> who cares? So I just use kitchen towels and uh, flip it. So. Hi, my next question is about when you write up recipes. It's, it's very clear from anybody who's read cooks how much work you guys put into developing your recipes and trying out every variation. Have you had a chance to do that with how you actually write up the recipes to present the information and help understand what's the best way to present it to people such that they're able to follow it? Oh, yes. Uh, we, yeah, there's, you know. Yes, uh, most of the stories, because we're, we're, we're dealing with cooks now, not writers. Most of the people who work for us don't have any writing experience. And so the editing process is tortured. Um, and, and, and I've been, uh, we had to make people cry <laughs> after reading the, I, I used to read everything. I stopped about a year ago. I, I read it, but not at the beginning. And I used to put comments in. My comments were usually something like, this is the worst first paragraph I've ever read in my life. So, I mean, what you get is, I remember my mother when she used to make, and I'd say, look, unless you can describe your mother in some detail and paint a picture, Nobody cares about your mother. I mean, you, you have to make us care. So, or people take a long time to get to a point. I think the, the issue is, I always said it's like a Sherlock Holmes story. You know, there's the one boot is missing in the Hound of the Baskervilles, you know. So when you're telling, a st you're telling the story of how you solve the problem of bad food to get to good food, it's a mystery. It's a narrative. You have to tell a story. A story has ups and downs. It has ins and outs. It has dead ends. So you have to construct that story. The problem is the test cook has tested in a certain order. And he or she then thinks it's a, it's a matter of simp a documentary process of documenting what they did. That has nothing to do with it. It's about creating a story. And so even though it, it doesn't seem when you read it that we've done a lot of work, we spend sometimes 50 or 60 hours on the story to tell a story. Because people have to care about the story. Who wants to read 2,000 words about fudgy brownies you know, unless you kind of make it interesting. And so a lot of the tests we leave out. It's like editing a Hollywood movie. You know, you got to cut characters out in scenes. It's the same thing. So it's all about storytelling and narrative. And then finally, we call it the aha moment, you know. When you finally, what's the big thing you discovered that, you know, made the recipe work? And hopefully there's something interesting, you know, so. When you were talking about cooking myths and how they're not true, um, you mentioned searing the meat, which we've heard actually from Harold McGee a couple times, but you also mentioned patting the meat dry before you saute it. And I don't think you followed through on why that's a myth. Well, I think I, what I said was um, you see that um, it, it's, it's, it's not a myth. It's something that people tell you to do, but people don't do it because they don't understand why they should do it. And, and the reason is, as I said, if you put the meat in the pan, it's wet until the water turns to steam and evaporates. The surface temperature of the meat's not going to go over uh, the boiling point of water. So all that energy is going into the water to turn it into steam. The energy is not going into the meat. So until that happens, you're sitting there in the pan with a fairly cool pan. You're not getting any browning. You're not getting any Maillard reaction. 
So it, that's one of those things you need to do. Uh, I, I, what I've discovered is people won't do what recipes tell you unless you understand it. And that was my problem too. So we're just trying to explain in some cases, not necessarily myth, but we're trying to explain why you should do it. And the odds of you doing it will be greater if, if we explain it. It's not because the water will spatter in the oil and get you burned? <laughs> uh, that would be true too. And uh, yes. And the other thing is that if it's wet, the uh, chicken skin will stick irretrievably to the bottom of the skillet. Yes. So. Hi. <clears throat> so among all of the home cooks that you've interacted in, with and sampled, What's the, what's the single way in which they've most, most tragically underinvested, under, underinvested in their home equipment, whether it's getting something lame that sh they should get a good version of it? Uh, three things. The first is an instant-read thermometer that really works. The only one we really love is the Thermapen. It's 95 hours. It's obscenely expensive, uh, but it really works. Uh, it takes a temperature from the end of the probe, not an inch or two up so you know exactly what you're measuring. It has a big readout display, it's instant. Um, I, I could cook without it, but it would be hard. I, I would bake bread, you know, American bread's 190 to 195, European bread 205 for custards, et cetera. Two, a knife. Um, Forstner makes a Victorinox Fibrox knife, it's 25 bucks. It beats the $150 knives all the time. Third thing is knife sharpening. Um, would die if I said go buy an electric knife sharpener. But go buy an electric knife sharpener. <laughs> the Chef's Choice Model 130, 140 uh, works great. There's no other way to sharpen a knife at home unless you're, you really want to stand there for 10 minutes with a sharpening stone, which you can do. Most people don't have the patience for it. One last thing, uh, the European knives have a 20 degree angle to them. The uh, combination east-west knives have a 15 degree angle. So if you sharpen a $200 you know, Gyoto knife uh, with a traditional uh, electric sharpener, you'll ruin the, the edge. So uh, Chef's Choice did come out with a model that'll do both, which is kind of important. The last thing I would say that's really important is a good 12-inch skillet. And you want, you know, all-clad still makes the best skillet. Um, I would invest in an all-clad. So those are the three or four things you definitely need. Thanks, that's a great yeah. answer. Hi, so there are some times that I search for recipes on America's Test Kitchen and I'll get results from Cook's Country and realize that I don't have a membership there and I didn't realize that recipe was part of it. Is there any work being done to sort of yes. give me the, yeah. Um, my, my, my head of IT who has a notebook and a pencil um, promises me by April, uh, it's very, we're rebuilding all the infrastructure, all of our sites. The problem is that uh, we have an outside vendor uh, that's owned by Hearst that, that handles all of our subscriptions and processing. And for us to do this entirely on our own without some of the things they offer is almost impossible. So we've been waiting for them to get up to speed. So we're right in the middle of the project. It should be done by May, at which point you can have uh, access to everything you know, it'll be easier. Because right now, if you go to three of our different sites, you have three different passwords, three different credit cards. It's very complicated. And then so. the last one, sorry. Um, is there going to be an app for the Android for America's Test Kitchen or any yeah, of the we're, others? Yeah, well, yes, yes. I can't heart say no. I mean, it would be, I wouldn't get out of here alive. Uh, yes. So America's changed uh, since you, know, you went to university. What have you learned from outside of America and brought in from the science perspective? Well, not so much from a science perspective, but I think what's interesting is there's been a restaurant revolution the last 30 years, obviously. And home cooking hasn't changed much, really. It's starting to in the last two years. We survey. Nothing goes into our magazines unless we survey it. We ask you what you want. It's that old story. Uh, in 1985, I was owned in part by The New Yorker. And so I had an office at The New Yorker's building. And Bill Sean, William Sean was the editor back then, if some of you may remember. And Cy Newhouse took Mr. Sean out for lunch at the Four Seasons and said, Mr. Sean, how do you determine what your readers want to read? And Mr. Sean said, I don't. And Mr. Newhouse said, what do you mean? He said, well, I just, I just put things in the magazine that I want to read. And I'm, I assume my readers have the same taste I do. Uh, he was fired four months later. Uh, and my answer to that is, we only put things in the magazine that you tell us you want because we don't take advertising. 
So we found in the last two years that what you want is starting to change. That being said, I have to say two things. The top 10 rated uh, recipes of all time out of 7,000 recipes we've rated, we rate every week, uh, uh, two of them are green bean casserole. <laughs> Somebody here makes green bean casserole. I mean, statistically, it has to be true. Um, I don't know why, but they do. Uh, uh, and, um, and, and so w what's starting to happen now is techniques, not necessarily science, but techniques. I mean, stir fry used to be ethnic at one time, right? Which is ridiculous, but it makes sense. Small pieces of food cook really quickly. You know, it's very, it's very variable. It, it got incorporated into the American repertoire fast. Now there are things, on, other things coming from different parts of the world that do make sense for American home cooking, and they are coming in. And I would think in the next five to eight years, you'll see a huge change in American home cooking. It's just starting, but it, it hasn't happened yet. People are still making that, you know, dried out lasagna. Uh, but that's, that's really changing. I would suggest that my favorite book currently is Otto Lange's Plenty. Um, I just, had, just got Jerusalem. I haven't tried, I've tried a couple things. I've cooked about half of the recipes in that. Because, you know, the Ottoman Empire was, you know, on the, in, the, in the spice trade, on the spice routes. They had 85 to 90 different spices. Northern Europe had a dozen spices. The Joy of Cooking originally had 15 spices. So there are ways of combining flavors. There are techniques uh, that we have never used here, because we're mostly Northern European style cooking, mostly. And there's a lot that's going to come in. So I think it's going to change completely. And I think people's uh, experience with food through restaurants has also changed. People have a much better, they know what sag paneer is now. I still don't want to make it at home, but <laughs> many people in my kitchen do. Uh, but no, it, it's going to change. So, so uh, at the beginning of your articles, you kind of have this description of what you're going for. You know, we want a tender crust or whatever. So, how do you? Where does that preference come from? Um, well, the, the question is, we have to pick a lane for a story, and so we survey and ask what people want. But at some point, uh, it depends on what we've done before. We have to come to it with a different point of view. But you can do chewy chocolate chip cookies, or you can do crispy chocolate chip cookies. And those are two, you know, not, one's not better than the other. Um, so it's, it's mostly what you say, and it's also our tastes, and whether we can think we can add some value because it's a new direction, it's something different. Um, sometimes we'll go back and do a, a story we did 10 years ago. Because uh, we found out actually it's not as good as it should be, like pumpkin pie or creme brulee. But it's mostly just a function of listening to what you guys want. Um, so. Okay, sorry, one more. Uh, <laughs> since I'm a new cook. Um, so when you're, a trouble, trouble I always have is doubling recipes. I always assume that if I need to double it for whatever reason, like a sauce or whatever, that I literally double every single ingredient I see, which yeah, not, okay. So are there certain things or a key yes. or something you should use, like never double your flour, only do a, well, know, that baking, amount in a quarter or something? Okay, savory versus baking. Savory, uh, a few things to watch out for. Don't double the heat or the spices. <laughs> because uh, you, you hold off and then taste as you go, but that's really a problem. Secondly, liquid, sometimes in a stew, if you're going to triple a stew, you don't need triple the liquid. So that's something you should look at. Um, the, the other thing is in baking, as you double a recipe, then the pan size doesn't necessarily, you need a different pan size, and you may end up with a, a thicker or, or more depth to the cake or whatever you're doing, so the cooking time is going to be off. You might have to, if you're going to create something bigger, you tend to lower the oven temperature by 25 degrees, so it, it's going to have to cook a little longer so you don't overcook the outside. In general, baking is tough. Um, and also, when you mix things together, like you're creaming butter and mixing things together, if you quadruple a recipe, when you mix it, you're going to overmix it to get everything mixed together. For example, when you make brownies, it always says, or should say, uh, with still free, stre streaks of flour left in the batter. Well, I know what you do because I do the same thing. I'm going like, hey, there's still streaks of flour in the batter. This can't be right. So, you know, you, you keep going a couple more. Well, what happens is you develop gluten as a result. The brownies uh, rise a little bit more because there's more structure, but they turn out cakey. They're not that good. So when you have double the recipe or quadruple the recipe, you end up mixing more. There's more agitation, and you end up. So very often in the test kitchen, we'll just make maybe double it, maybe not, and just make more than one batch. But ba baking is particularly difficult. So like, what about the cider braised pork steaks, like a recipe like that? That's not a problem. You can double 
in, yeah. Um, in the magazine where the people write in with questions, um, there was once uh, a question about using California bay laurel leaves instead oh, yeah. of jar Turkish. Bales. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the answer was that it wasn't worth the price to, to use California. But the thing is, is that we're here in California, a lot of people have those trees like in their yard, so it's free. And so I was wondering, can it actually, can you use the, the bay that grows around here? And do you, like, do you use a different amount or is it just one? I, I do remember that ladder was few years ago. I think we decided that we preferred actually the California, I think. but. Um, yeah, sure, you can use them. I mean, I think my pet peeve is, and I argue this all the time, you know recipes, you're, you're doing a stew for 12 people and it says add a sprig of thyme. I mean, are you kidding me? I mean, like, I don't know, maybe the French had particularly pungent thyme, but I mean, a sprig of thyme isn't going to do anything. You just, you're never going to know it's there. And sometimes I feel the same way about bay leaves, that I always add an extra one. So yeah, you can use it, sure. But I, I think one thing I've learned is also, Towards the end of cooking, I mean, that's unless it's baking, but if it's a stew, a soup, or whatever, taste it. You know, people just assume uh, my 22 year old loves, loves to cook, and she'll just follow the recipe and won't taste it and serve it. And, you know, it needs salt, it needs something else, a little vinegar. Uh, but at the, at the end of cooking, fresh herbs are best added at the end. Um, you know, grated or minced ginger, garlic. Um, there's lots of little things you can add at the end of cooking vinegar, lemon juice to get the balance right. And so that's the most important part of cooking, um, other than cleaning up, is the last five minutes. Uh, and, and adding those things at the end. And there's also secret ingredients. You know, Years ago, I, someone in my office mentioned pomegranate molasses, and I made fun of them, because it's a stupid, hard to find ingredient. Now it's not hard to find. That's one of the things I have at my disposal when I'm cooking, so just to get the balance right. It's a little sweet, a little sour. Um, so it's that last minute that's really important. So you mentioned about um, thinking that there's new um, spices and that kind of thing, new, maybe some new techniques coming from around the world. Um, what about just new kind of approaches at, and I guess more technology in the kitchen? Um, I don't think I've Well, sure. Um, yes, we're doing cookers. pressure cook. We're doing a pressure cooker book right now. Um, that's actually going to be huge because it's fast. It's not a slow cooker. It's, it's a fast cooker. Uh, you can make the world's best chicken stock in 15 minutes. Uh, you can make risotto in 15 minutes. Uh, and also, pressure cooker turns out great food. So that's going to be big. Sous vide is, you know, everyone's talking about sous vide. You know, I'm it's not... It's getting to be affordable now. This is a $400, $450 one we liked, which is... I mean, the problem with that is money's one issue, but then what do you do with it? You know? I'm sorry. I, I've gotten down to, like, small things now because these big things, you know, you got to take it out. But yes, yeah, sous vide's fine. Although, I have to say, the problem with sous vide for me is um, I like to chew my food. And I, I find, some, like, have you ever had a, a turkey sandwich made with sous vide turkey? It feels kind of wet, you know? And so I, I, I kind of, as, as a friend of mine said about turkey at Thanksgiving, you know, he says he likes overcooked white meat. Because that's the tradition in his house. And he said that's why God invented gravy, you know? Well. <laughs> Who wants gravy in a particularly moist piece of white meat? It just doesn't work. So I, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's a great way of cooking. But that, I don't think that's going to be in everybody's kitchen. But I think the pressure cooker is probably one of those things that will be. So thank you very much.